Hello, this is the uh, second half of uh, the packet I mean, going over the answers here. Um, we're taking a look today, how did Justinian and Theodora gain, consolidate, and maintain power in the Byzantine Empire? All right, that's what we're gonna be taking a look at. So let me go down to here, and we'll start where this kind of starts at the top. All right, I think the first thing to talk about is what do those terms mean? Gain, consolidate, and maintain. You've got some excellent artwork here. It looks like I drew it, very high quality. Uh, gaining power is the process of getting it and expanding it. So you gain something by getting more of it, right? To consolidate means to uh, take control from other people or to bring power from disparate sources or different sources uh, together and uh, bring it into one location. I always I think like consolidate. I always think of if I have like uh, my dirty clothes I left all over the house and Mrs. Summer just wants me to consolidate them into the laundry hamper uh, instead of having to look at them all over the house. And maintain means the process of keeping one's power, right? You're not taking it from other people. You're not expanding it. You're keeping what you have. And I like that with the little thing there, right? They're pretty protecting his money. All right. Okay, so let's start. Um, what was the Byzantine Empire? Who were Justinian and Theodora? Okay, I'm not going to show you the clip. Hopefully you've watched that on your own. And it gives you a little thing here with uh, text. Wanted to point out a couple things in the text that I think are interesting. Um, and there are these little clues that I think um, students often miss in reading. Um, I've told you before that when you're reading history, you always want to look for the thinking skill that the author is talking about, right? Um, you'll rarely read anything in academic history that is just a description of stuff. Uh, normally, they're going to be talking about cause and effect. Uh, they're going to be comparing and contrasting two things, or they're going to be talking about continuity and change over time, right? And there are a lot of times a little context clues inside the text that will help you figure out what's going on. So if you look here, right, um, with this one, even though the Western province collapsed, the Eastern province survived, right? Even though is set up to be a comparative statement. Even though I should eat broccoli, today I had cake, right? Which is probably during this time very true, right? So you want to be looking for, uh, I should ask my wife what these little phrases are called, but you want to be looking for these little phrases that indicate what the author is trying to attack, right? In the same case here, unlike, unlike is, is a term that is always used for comparison. And you can see here, they, uh, the author is comparing uh, the Western province of the Roman Empire to the Eastern province, which becomes the Byzantine Empire. Right. So to answer the question, and we've seen this before we did Rome, um, the Roman Empire for a long period of time comprised almost all of this territory, eventually under Diocletian and um, Con uh, Constantine, uh, uh, it's split into the western, right, the red, and the eastern portion. Um, the eastern portion is wealthier because of its connections, trade routes, right? The Roman Empire always made its wealth uh, in this direction uh, because of all of these nations' connections to trade, right? Um, so after it falls, right, we use the word divergent there. Uh, two different sorts of societies develop over time, politically, socially, culturally. Uh, in the West, it's going to be more Latin-based, with Latin uh, being the language, it is going to be Catholic, like Roman Catholic, uh, as far as its Christian faith is concerned. Uh, in the East, it's going to be, instead of Latin, it's going to be Greek. Greek is going to be the language that is spoken here, and uh, after something called the Great Schism or Schism, the East becomes Eastern Orthodox, which is another form of Christianity that still exists today in churches like the Greek Orthodox or the Russian Orthodox Church. Okay, 
the two monarchs that are best known. Uh, this is Justinian and Theodora. Hopefully you watch that video link up here. Uh, certainly those engineering and empire videos are really interesting. There's a lot of cool stuff in that. Um, I'm only saying watch two minutes of it. There's lots of really interesting things in there, especially about Theodora. She is a woman ahead of her time, right? Uh, and you can even see in here, this would be what we would look at as Byzantine um, art, right? In a mosaic tile, right? And certainly a much more Eastern attire uh, than you would think of uh, in the Roman Empire, right? So I've answered a couple of these questions just very quickly here for you. So my answer is on blue, right? How is Justinian and Theodore's Byzantine Empire different than Western Europe? Uh, what, now, it's talking about Western Europe after the fall of Rome, right? So at that time. And so we have to kind of recall back that we know that after Rome fell, that the West becomes very decentralized. We'll see later on. Uh, it'll become feudal, uh, which is very de uh, decentralized, that the power is located in small areas, castles, right, and not in one location. Right? Whereas in the Byzantine Empire, it is they centralize their power, and you can see the description of what that is there, right? All the power and decision making is concentrated in one unit instead of having uh, power in the hands of many different people in different locations. Right? The fall of Rome will lead to a decentralized government, whereas in the Byzantine Empire, they are going to increase the centralization. They're known as autocrats. Right, and it gets into a little bit of it here. They are sole leaders with absolute authority. And the one example uh, has to do with religion, right? In the Byzantine Empire, the emperor is also the head of the church. Uh, it's a term that when this topic was getting covered in AP World, the term was Caesar, Caesar Popism, right? So they combined the words Caesar and Pope. Uh, meaning that Justinian is the head of both the state and the religion. That's why I like that little phrase, co-ruler with Jesus. Whereas in the West, even if you're a monarch, even later on in history, the 1500s, right? The, the Pope would have all the religious authority and the kings would have political authority and there was some competition between the two of them there, right? So East, these, uh, uh, the Byzantine rulers had a lot more power in the West. Uh, the kings, while they had power, uh, <clears throat> were more limited in the areas of religion. What title did Justinian give Theodora? Uh, he made her his co-empress. Now, again, in that video, there's a lots of interesting things there about who Theodora was. Um, what can we infer about their relationship? Um, I think you can infer a number of things that I did not write down, that he valued her. Um, how, how can I infer that? Well, because he didn't have to make her his co-emperor, and he did. He wanted to um, enable her to have a certain level of power so that she could rule with him as his partner. Um, I can probably argue and infer uh, that he loved and cared about her. If you look at the story, right, about where she came from, I think um, one can make the argument that he was trying to protect her from um, the whispers of the courts and the people and, and make a very bold statement that, um, you know, she is as, is as entitled to power and rule as I am, regardless of where she comes from in the past. Um, you know, I think. Um, Again, we can infer that, and she probably, we can infer that she probably ruled quite effectively. Uh, I know one of the documents is about the Nika revolt, and she's the one that convinced him to stay, right? Um, I think they become a very interesting couple in history, and you can always just Google them and read more about them at some point, because they are probably the, uh, off the top of my head, the Bill and Hillary Clinton uh, of their day. So now we get down to here, the documents are all, they're looking at you to do document analysis to figure out whether or not they offer uh, consolidate, gain, maintain power in the Byzantine Empire. 
I'm not going to get too deep into these guys. Um, right. So the first thing you look is the map of the expansion uh, during the reign of Justinian and Theodora. And generally what you can see is this is where they started and they conquered all this land. Right. So I went with they gained power. Right? Why do I think they're gaining power? Because they're using military conquest to expand the territory they control. Right? Justinian and Theodora are attempting to reunite the glory that was Rome. Uh, if you look down here is the Nika revolts. I really think the Nika revolts are fascinating. Um, you know, certainly as a soccer fan, like I love the idea that people went to these chariot races and um, had their favorite teams that were based on color and, um, you know, these teams were associated with where you lived and your political beliefs. Now, that works in our world today, right? We, you know, we Buffalo Bills fans tend to come from Buffalo, but they don't tend to be associated with political beliefs. What I will tell you is that uh, European soccer, specifically uh, in Great Britain, very much so, people's political beliefs um, and their sense of what they believed in really did grow up around these local football clubs. Uh, for example, you know, my favorite club, Liverpool, is actually really associated with fairly socialist political beliefs, even though I'm not really a socialist. Um, so it's interesting to me to see uh, what's happening here. So since the emperor's team was the Blues, you can see by rooting against the Blues, you're rooting against the emperor and it's a way of protesting him, and by supporting his team, you can make a statement that I support the emperor as well. Um, so there are a series of riots here. Procopius is going to describe what happens, right? I kind of talk about, you can make the argument that they're maintaining or consolidating power there, um, you know, because they're trying to get thrown out. One can argue that by staying and fighting against this, they're maintaining power. One can make the argument that they are consolidating power because they can identify who their opponents are and eliminate them. Um, one thing that I want to point out is interesting, uh, and I wish we had time for, is this guy Procopius, right? This is the official history that he is writing um, for Justinian and Theodora, these events for them to read. He also writes something later on called The Secret History, in which he says a lot of nasty things about Justinian and Theodora. So if we were going to analyze these documents, right, you could probably take this one, that's the official history, and you could put it next to the secret history, and they're not going to say the same things. Right? Later on, we can talk about how purpose of the document uh, kind of changes what we believe, right? So that in writing in secret, that might be more reliable than this. Um, but we could also argue that the bad things Procopius would say in his secret history is because he didn't like them, that he wanted to make them look bad in the same way that the reliability for this one might be questioned because this is the official history. If he opposes them, if he says anything bad, what will happen? Well, he'll be killed. So this might gloss over some bad events or might be written to make them look good. Okay. The next two are Justinian's code. Um, I don't want to make this video a million hours long. Um, Right, so for this one, I, you can talk about consolidate or gain power by rewriting the old Roman laws, um, by taking this very unwieldy thousands of laws and trying to reconsolidate it into one easy to understand book of laws. We can certainly make the argument that he is consolidating power, um, you know, as one because uh, poorly written laws that people don't understand might enable other elements of society to take advantage of them, uh, take advantage of the people. Um, by doing this, by creating one law that is easy to understand and that all the people know, right, uh, he can create this sense of stability for people that at least is, one could argue, maintain, if not uh, consolidate his power. Uh, and you can see in this one, this deals with slavery. It's the relationship between slaves and their owners. Again, when we talk about slavery, we're not talking about people from sub-Saharan Africa necessarily. We're talking just about people who are slaves. Again, the term slave comes from the Eastern European term Slavic, right? Uh, just, again, want to remind people that slave 
uh, is often misunderstood because you're Americans, you're American kids, and you know a lot more about American history, and you associate slavery with sub, uh, sub-Saharan Africans. Okay. In this one as well, uh, this one's kind of interesting. Uh, this is about marriage, right? Our children begotten in a lawful marriage are in our power, meaning, right, uh, the relationship of power between parents and children. Okay, um, he's talking about uh, a concept under in, in ancient Rome called paterfamilias, which the father has the power of life and death over his children. The child born to you and your wife is in your power. And you can see evidence even in here of the patriarchy, but the child born of your daughter is not in your power, but in the power of its own father, right? This idea here that the that power over children resides through the male line is very much a patriarchal uh, concept. This is about the making of wills. Um, again, this is just about the, the procedure of everyday life. Uh, and by clarifying how property is passed and how children are to be ruled over, we can make the argument that this is consolidating and maintaining power as well, right? Religious order and persecution. Um, so again, we come back to religion. Uh, the Byzantine Empire was Eastern Orthodox. Uh, the Byzantine Emperor um, is in charge of both, right? The religious institutions of the Eastern Orthodox Church report to Justinian, right? Or the emperor, the, any emperor of the Byzantine Empire. And one of the things that he did is he went through the empire and made paganism, right? The worship of not Christianity or not a monotheistic faith, right? Someone that would, uh, you wouldn't be familiar with it. Uh, I'm trying to think of uh, like uh, the ancient Greek or Roman religions, uh, Mithraism, right? But even he got rid of the school that taught Plato's philosophy. He got rid of any religion generally that was not Eastern Orthodox, okay? And he restricted the rights of the people, uh, the Jewish people in this as well. And as a result of that, lots of people converted. You know, on a side note to me, what's interesting is for an empire that um, is so involved with trade, right? By writing these laws, I feel like this would discourage people um, from other religions to want to live in the Byzantine Empire. One could argue this could hurt his power. The other thing that's here that's kind of, um, uh, that is really inferred that you might have picked up on is they're, they're, they're coining, right? They, uh, they have a, uh, a, a system of coins or money that uh, is used in this empire and yes, his picture is on it. Yes, there are some crosses on the different variations of a Christian cross on there. But what you can talk about here is economically, this really could increase the power of the Byzantine Empire and Emperor in that um, one unified system of coin, right, will help increase trade um, versus maybe different forms of money. Uh, and in fact, Byzantine coin uh, was well sought after and used and really did increase trade and for a government increased trade always means increased money. Okay. Now coming down to this, um, for those of you going on to Global 2, you're going to learn more about Enduring Issues. I'll say I'm just going to use their thing that's going on there. If you're staying with me, you're not going to learn about these types of essays until the end of Global 2 because I don't want to confuse you, but what I am looking at here is structure for you real quick. Um, if you look, there is a general thesis, right, is that people throughout history try to gain and consolidate and maintain power, right? And one group of people, uh, people's thirst for power and the strategy that they have used to keep it can be seen in the Byzantine Empire under the reign of Justinian and Theodora. And then they give you two other examples. Don't worry about it. So I am treating this uh, question here like I am writing one body paragraph, right? So I've written the topic sentence. Remember, the topic sentence is the thesis of the paragraph. So what am I setting out to prove here? And I want you to look carefully. Notice, I don't use 
uh, I think they're called indefinite articles, things, it, them, you need to, in academic writing, um, you know, remove those from your vocabulary in writing. The same way that you, you would talk differently to your parents versus your friends versus your grandparents versus, uh, I don't know, um, somebody that's interviewing you for a job. You would you use different language. You, would, you certainly wouldn't talk to uh, your grandparents, I would hope, uh, the same way or send them a text message the same way that you would uh, text message your friends, right? So we have to think about how we use, uh, how we are supposed to write for an academic audience. Okay. So my topic sentence, the Byzantine Empire under the reign of Justinian and Theodora is one example of how people and government sought to gain, maintain, consolidate power. Notice I went back up in here to the introduction. I've taken the idea, right? Uh, and remembering that the way this was described uh, they're just one example here in the thesis, um, okay? And so everything in this uh, uh, has to be, everything in this paragraph has to be how Justinian and Theodora are either gaining power, right? Maintaining power, consolidating power. So I just kind of wrote what my next sentence would be. One example of how, uh, of how that should say, Justinian and Theodora used war to expand their territory, right? Oh, one example is how, sorry, I misread, Justin and Theodora uh, used war to expand their territory. And I put document one, because if you look, right, I'm not saying one thing that proves this is a map. That's not, maps prove nothing, right? I'm saying is they used war because the map of the document serves as evidence of an idea, right? And then I would go on to describe, I'm not going to write the whole thing, how war was used to expand their power, how and why war was used, right? What wars happened? How does this expand their power? Another example can be seen in the rewriting of the Byzantine law code and the creation of what is known as Justinian's code, right? I should have put documents, uh, I think those are three and four, I think, right? Um, and then I would go on to describe how these new laws, or the, the Justinian's code, right, uh, help Justinian and Theodora gain, maintain, or expand their power um, or that of the states, right? And then finally, Justinian and Theodora, you know, I need to check something because I'm goofy. One, two, three. Oh, they were 3A and 3B. That's what my problem was, right? So that should be 3A and 3B, but I'm correct there, right? Expanded their power was through eliminating all religions that weren't Christianity. Notice again, I am not just saying one example is document four. No. What's the idea? They are eliminating all religions that are Christianity. And then I would go on to describe, right, and explain how and why them eliminating opposition would expand their power or that of the state. Okay. Hopefully this is helpful for you. Um, you know, you try to keep doing this while we're all out on break and hopefully I stayed in a reasonable amount of time um, Message me if you have any questions or something didn't seem uh, to make sense for you. Bye-bye.